everybody start in horse then? Do the first sequence. Let's go to the other side. So, what both of you said about this position was that it was for holding the enemy. If David wants to punch my head, I'm by Scott position. Now, if he was really trying to hit me, that's not going to be enough probably need to eat something. But that's why I'm also moving off to the side. Does everybody see how my head is offline? If I'm close to this shoulder, it's hard for me to him to hit me with that hand. And I control. Everybody got it? What you're gonna do is you're gonna move in, just go nice and slow, and hold that position. Now we're gonna test a little bit. If I wanna hit Darshan, what am I going to do with this arm? I'm gonna go around. That way. So he needs to respond to that. He reestablishes that grip. So everybody understand what else is what I try to do. Could you even do a slide? Could, but let's just say I'm trying to punch him. Uppercut. Uppercut, yeah. You change the angle of the punch too. Number one thing is I'm going to reorient myself. Say he's in front of me rather than off to the side. And I roll around and hit. All that he's going to try to do is prevent me from doing those two things. So he follows me. It's not that I won't touch his head, but I'm not going to get a clean shot. Any questions? What I want to do is clear my arm and turn towards him. He's not just going to stay there. He responds. Stays off to the side. Right there. Simple enough. You want to think concepts here. Get into a position of control, hit them. The form shows us an elbow. If we change it to a punch, are we fundamentally changing anything? Not really. And this is what's gonna make you understand the nature of forms a little bit better. It's just concepts, it's just examples. It doesn't have to be exact, in fact, it never will be exactly like the form. Not if you fight it. Nice and easy, build up to it. Don't need to go fast. And once I see the opportunity, I need to step back and wait. Ah, uh, just take turns. Master, record. Record. Okay, master, record. Okay, master, record. Master, record. Master, record. Master, record. Master, record. And this is just a demonstration. Darshan's really, you know, going with it for me right now. Right? With that big turn. Most of the time, you will not get your partner to turn that much. Right? It's more of a common. I get a tiny angle, that's all you need. There's also, of course, no reason you can't go up high with it either. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start from a slightly different position. Arms just touching. This is gonna be less resistance, less accuracy. Some of you guys are feeling a little overwhelmed from the elbow strikes. This will be a little easier for you. Grab. We can also put the two together, right? Very easy. So I start here. Boom. He brings his hand under and he blocks. Simple enough. Grab the opponent. Hit the opponent. Arm gets in the way. Pull the arm down. Hit the opponent. Grab the enemy. Hit the enemy. Something gets in the way, move it out of the way, keep hitting him. Simple enough? Yeah. Soft tap. You're doing that until the white belt. 
And that's actually what most of this says about it as well. Is that the stepping motion is to move in and engage with the opponent. This position is to grab. I'm at a little bit of a distance. This guy wants to beat me up. I'm like, whoa, buddy, relax. Relax, he's not relaxing. So we're just going to start right from where we left off. I have this arm, punch him. So I can step out. That's what we do next. We know a little bit about joint locks, and I can tell you right, that you will not be, it will not, you will not forcibly straighten someone's arm if it's bent. I'm bigger and stronger than Darshan. Ready? No way. <coughs> The reason why it works on the ground in jiu-jitsu is because you're literally, if you guys are familiar with an arm bar on the ground, you're literally using your whole body to straighten. That's how you're able to overpower an arm. Make sense? Even my two arms together are not going to forcibly straighten his arm. And always remember, while I'm trying to do this, he's punching me in the face, of course. Does everybody understand? Sparring is not fighting. It can be realistic, it teaches, it's an absolutely crucial part of our training because it's the closest thing to fighting that we do, but it's not the same thing. If I do this, you let me do it, don't let me do it. But if I blast him hard, repeatedly, he doesn't want to get hit, you see what he just did? He straightens it for me. If the arm is already straight, then yes, this works, no problem. Does everybody understand? The way I want you to do it is you hit, contact on the tricep, right? Make sure his thumb is pointing down, right? So the elbow is going towards the ceiling. And then I just step through and drop my weight. Got it? Any questions? Do it try. Kung Sudo does this next sequence a little bit differently. I'd say it's, it's not too different though, it's just exaggerated, right? Bigger. So I show you Nahachi from Motobu's 1932 book, where next part, something like that, right? Our style, right? It's just bigger, exaggerated, right? I want, where it's what my application is much more similar to the way Motobu does it. This is called collar tie in wrestling, just grip behind the neck. We're both gripping the same way. And just have an angle. That's it. I want you guys to take this position. Okay. Let's move around a little bit. Good. Just get used to the feeling of being attached, the feeling of clinching. Then you can switch sides. We'll do it on the other side. Simple enough? Let's give it a try. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Again, it's up the rules. I'll never hear it. It actually is common that we kind of have this lifting motion. Whether or not that was intentionally there to be a knee strike, I don't know. Whether or not it's explicitly found in the movements, it fits very well when you're in nice and close. Makes sense? You can, of course, knee to the body. You need a knee to the head, and that's a knockout shot. It's risky though. It depends on your kicking ability. It's real kung to do, so many of us can kick pretty well. <laughs> but as a general rule, I think it's good to go by this. Legs hit lower targets, arms hit higher targets. Right? That's where your legs are. That's where my arms are. Make sense? I'm a big fan of these knee strikes. Nasty, right? Nasty, right? And even just to set up, right? So I go, boom, bang. Make sense? You can get one hell of a dead leg from those. It works the same way. The inside is particularly bad. The outside is maybe a little bit not as bad. Boom. Still pretty bad though, right? <laughs> <laughs> you go a little bit higher than that, then of course, there's the groin which is a very, very good target to go for. But a lot of the time, a lot of self-defense-based stuff, people like kind of overemphasize how effective groin strikes can be. 
hurts a lot to get hit in the groin, right? But when you're amped up and you're fighting your life, right, you'd be surprised the kinds of you don't even feel it in the moment. You feel it later, right? Does everybody understand? But just don't think that it's automatically, you know, everybody who does martial arts and favorite times has been hit in the groin and just like you feel incapacitated by it. Right? But that's because when we're training a lot of the time, we're getting to an optimal level of adrenalization. Where we're have, we're faster, we're stronger, but we still have good control over our bodies. When you are amped up, right, we call it an adrenaline dump, you lose a lot of your body's control, but you also just don't even feel pain. Does that make sense? So anything that's just compliant on pain can be a little bit sketchy with stuff like that. Groin strikes are are definitely effective. I'm just saying it's not a it's not a guaranteed fight ender, which is often portrayed as. Everybody follow? In general, what makes these most effective is I'm breaking posture. If I have Marcus like this, this is perfect for me. If he's more upright, head up high, that's a lot more risky for me. A lot less effective and a lot higher risk for me. So this position that we're in, that's where I want you to start. It's a small setup step. Bom. To the outside. Bom. Going high. I can go straight. I can go around. Everybody got? Just so you know, this is like the first thing and one of the most relevant ones you can integrate into your larger sparring practice. So we're fighting from long range, like we typically do, just giving nice slow motion, right? So we're just going, we're doing our typical <coughs> kung sudo kind of sparring here. Does everybody see that? Stepping in and knee. And again, talking about self-defense, a lot of time you're close range, right? If somebody wants to attack you, it's not like, let's go, right? <laughs> That's mutual combat. This guy wants to beat me up. I'm like, I want to fight you. Get out of here. Oh, now my back is up against the wall. Does that make sense? That's one of the reasons why, but it's not that like close range practice is true karate, right? Or more important or better, right? I'd say it might be more important for self-defense just because of the nature of that practice. I'm not consenting to fight be forced to fight, which probably means I'm cornered. You should walk away from a fight if you can, right? <laughs> if I can't walk away, what happens? The distance closes. Make sense? That's it, all that I would say. And this is not something I believe is an original application. Again, going back to Mojibu, he started here. <laughs> a little bit different, <laughs> right? A lot of the older styles, I believe there's a video of Funakoshi in the early 1900s, he started here. Most styles today usually do something like this, which we do as well. And not just in the hachi either. A lot of different forms, you know, depending on the style. It's a very common motion that you have in the beginning. This is often called the tie clinch. You see that? And I can break his posture. If possible, break it all the way down. I'm not trying to create something that's historically accurate with my applications. History interests me, I think it's relevant. I do want to understand the way people train in the past, but more so than anything else, I just want something that works. That makes sense to everybody? So we start here, I'm gonna go one more time, all I want you to do is get your hands free. Now real quick, posture up, get your head up hard. Weep, right? I'm on the back of his neck right now. Watch this, don't let me pull you down. Back of the head, totally different, why? If I put him on his neck here, he stands up. I'm fighting against his shoulders, his core, right? Big muscle groups. I go here, I'm putting that pressure directly into the small muscles of his neck. Breaks his posture. And as you can see from here, this is golden for knees, right? See what he's doing here? He's blocking with his arms, which he can do. If I throw that knee hard, it will often will go through those arms. Even if it doesn't, say he uses both arms more likely. It says elbow me on his head. If we go really close. That makes sense? It's nice and easy right now. Go under and through. You can grab the neck to start, 
But to break his posture, you need to transition up to the back of the head, pull down, knee. Marcus does. The hot shoe is one of the shortest forms we have, right? So simple on the surface, but as you guys can see, when you really start to delve into it, there's a lot there. This is why some people like to describe it that a single form used to represent like a style, right? It's a system of fighting in and of itself. And it's not because you, know, you only use the movements that are exclusive, explicitly shown in the form, but it's because it's about the concept. Does that make sense? Certainly. And that's how you're able to spar with it. Because you can adapt and you can vary these concepts and it can manifest itself in all kinds of different little te technical differences. Alright, let's try the other side. The oldest footage you can find of a Kung Sudo practitioner is from a film that was made in Korea in 1960. And the way that they did this part of Nahachi, I forget the practitioner's name, was like this. One, two, three. They do it like a big uppercut, which I love. Uppercuts are great strikes. So we're moving around, we're sparring, we're doing all kinds of stuff, he's doing whatever, right? This arm is blocking my strikes. Strip it. Okay. Simple enough? Yeah, I do believe the first half of the form is showing you your face. Grab them, smash them. Second half of the form is showing you some more complicated techniques, the more supplemental. Give it a try. Motobu said that this position is a preparation for a kick. I don't know exactly what he means. Could be a couple of different things, but I've seen these applications. It could mean this, this, right? Um, yeah. Personally, I really like the forward kick though. The way that I use this technique safely, well, it's always relatively safe. The martial art guys, you know, just don't, don't make it so safe before we're not practicing martial art anymore. But the way that I find and comfortable with is I aim for the thigh and I push. Can I see what his head just did? Well, most of you said this was a preparation for a kick. And just like the knee strikes, those straight kicks low work really well with everything else that we're practicing. If I were, model real quick, to try to injure somebody's leg like this, the way that I would do it is it comes up and then just move your leg. I'm stomping through. That's not the way that we, we do it in sparring. I'm just trying to push the leg back. By pushing his leg back, his head goes forward, and that creates openings for other strikes. It's effective just like that. We've seen enough injuries. I've seen enough injuries where people are wrestling around, and all they just try to do is just turn the hips to throw somebody. Yeah. And you do it. So, that being said, it doesn't take excessive force. It just takes the wrong angle, right, with the wrong amount of pressure. And those are the things we don't want to find out. All right? It's a little bit longer range. I mean, close like this, you don't have the best angle for this. It's more when we're out here. We're going back to where we started. And you go. Just like that. You see what he just did? Do it again. That's all that you're really going for. When I straighten that knee, it's subtle, right? Because we're going slow. Go. See that head move forward? Now, this position isn't great because I'm grabbing the sleeve right now, right? But if you were to suppress that arm, do the kick. Really nice setup for that elbow. Sounds good? Be careful. Does everybody understand? This is not worth it. When you learn a martial art, there's an element of it that you want to be able to fight and defend yourself. Obviously. And there's an element of it that's just personal interest. Does that make sense to everybody? Certainly. If you are that desperate to know how to fight and defend yourself, I'd say there's probably something about your lifestyle that needs to change. Martial arts are also just a fun hobby, something that enriches my life. 
Make sense? And that's a lot of what this stuff goes for. I have techniques in mind that are like my go-tos. This is not one of them because I cannot train it with intensity. I, even though we do use this technique, it's a very, it has a very limited role to play and we use it very carefully. Does that make sense? So one more time, I work with Darshan all the time, so we've been using this stuff a lot. It's called the nice medium pace. Okay. Very good. Not a lot of power, and more importantly, it is not weight. My weight isn't moving forward, I'm just kicking out. That's it. We got it? Good job. know absolutely existed were takedowns. Put a coach he included eight throws in his book, Try to Kill Off. They're absolutely there. Um, I really like foot sweeps because it is a way of getting your opponent to the floor where you are pretty likely to, see, to remain on your feet. Does that make sense? So that's the role that um, even if and not, I, I cross train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and I do believe that knowing how to defend yourself on the ground is a really important skill to have. All of that said, though, even if you're really good at that, the floor is still a very dangerous place to be. Because self defense includes multiple attackers. Does that make sense? Yeah. And people die getting hit on the ground. Right? Really. Like when you somebody's on the ground getting kicked by multiple people, that like likely to result in serious injury and death. And that's the real world. I'm not saying that you know always happen. But I'm also not saying you shouldn't practice a grappling art, wrestling similar thing, right? Because knowing how to grapple on the ground will give you the best chance to know how to get back up to your feet if you end up there. But the only situation where I would do something, a kind of a throw that ends with me on the floor, is if I'm taking him down to give somebody else a chance to get away. Does that make sense? If I'm defending myself, and I want to pin them on the ground for a reason. If I don't want to pin them, I want to be on my feet. And foot sweeps are perfect for Right ball. Sweep and down. Sweep and down. And then second half of the form, we just do it the other side, same thing. If you put those two motions together, it starts to really look like a foot sweep, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Stun in the form though is like a separate motion. And you can interpret this as a hammer fist which is a good close range strike. So something that you experience sometimes. If I'm grappling with Marcus and he's giving me strong forward pressure, so he steps forward and he blades himself. This can be a perfect setup. Right? And now this is a really important point to make. You wanna make a T with them. This is true of a lot of throws, definitely true of the foot sweeps. Marcus, if I see our feet make a T, this is the angle that you want. It's easy for me to attack that foot. Any questions? Just a quick reminder, when you feel yourself falling a lot, you don't want to catch yourself on your wrist. Easy to break your wrist that way. You also don't want your head to hit the ground, so chin goes towards the chest. It's not a hard takedown. Drop him. Not slamming him on the ground, right? Put him down salt. Everybody got it? Shigoro Okano, the founder of Judo, the reason why he said he chose throws, because Japanese Jiu Jitsu originally had all that striking, like groundwork, right, and all these different areas. Judo chose to concentrate on throws, Kano said, because he considered them the most difficult skill to master. It wasn't because it was more important, <laughs> it was more practical and more effective, he just considered it more difficult. And so practicing a martial art considered throws to be the best thing to, uh, to, for them to concentrate on, right? Throwing is really, really hard to get the hang of. I am not particularly good at it myself. I have some practical ability where I can get somebody down, right? It's not letting me, 
but just slow down. This is the perfect time to just remove resistance from it entirely. That's not enough, <laughs> right? I have to be here. It's not easy to catch, right? So I say, especially somebody that's like, like aware and resisting you, right? They're not just going to stay there. It's a vulnerable position. But if you're, if you're good at recognizing the opportunity, you can see it and you can capitalize on it. So if he's grabbing me here, pulling my head down, trying to hit me with knees, I got a problem. Now, there's a lot of different ways that I can respond to it. I can come to the inside. Look at that. Right where we started. Right, what if he doesn't let me do that? So I try to get my arms in between. See what he just did? Pinch his elbows together. Grab across to restrict, frame. Now I want you to pull me down, break my posture. Can't, right, because I created a wedge. Anybody see that? Mm -hmm. What he needs is my head here. And then he's using, again, his big muscle groups to pull me down. Make sense? If I'm there, though, we can't do that. It's a pretty nice position where I can just hit with those quick little shots, too. He'll let go quickly from that. <laughs> just start. In this position. And I'd like to build to it as we go. This is a good pace. Right? Not really worrying about whether or not my partner gets a strike in him, because it's not competitive. A large part of what I've done in my historical research and just through my training is try to recreate my best guess as to what sparring was like from the time the form comes from. And in my opinion, it's a really good supplement for our long range skills. Does that make sense? Sure. Somebody comes in and grabs you, right? And you're all there. It's all there. Knee, elbow, takedown, different grips. Thank you so much for coming. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Don't face mask, friend. Yeah. So the main thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Nice job. 